Dr. Love, the doctor of politics, and here we have an actual real doctor in the studio with us to tell us about some of the greatest misconceptions in the oral health care industry. Welcome, Dr. Ellie Phillips. Hi, thanks, Robert, for inviting me here. Well, it's wonderful to have you. Now, Dr. Phillips, before we get started, can you tell us about your experience in dentistry and your expertise and kind of what led you to sure. where you are today? Sure. I, I love talking about my story is an interesting one because I was one of England's first women dentists. It was pretty difficult to become a dentist back in that era, which was in the 60s. And in fact, they insisted that we would have top grades in three science subjects, chemistry, physics, and biology. And unless we got top grades, uh, 4.0 average as it would be in America, we weren't allowed to even consider going to medical school. About, you know, Austin should be the front runner. You, you guys here are so wonderful, and you talk about freedom, liberty, and, and uh, empowerment. This is what I do in dentistry. The public need to know the truth. They need to be free of this fear that they require the authority, in this case, dentists, to look after them. You can be empowered. You can look after yourself. You don't need these things. So Give it to you. How, how are you empowering people? This, this sounds, uh, this sounds well, like a wonderful thing to empower people to be able to control their own destiny concerning their oral health. Oral health. I, I try to do what I learned in Switzerland, which is teach people how to eat, at the end of every meal, something that is tooth protective. Try not to have long periods of acidity in your mouth. Try to understand which foods and which drinks damage your teeth and which ones will help them. Which toothpaste is safe to use. And believe me, most of them are not. And it's not about fluoride in toothpaste. I mean, there are other things that are far more damaging. Let's talk about what, what foods are damaging. That I didn't know there were foods that are damaging to my teeth. Oh, certainly. Citrus fruits, for example, will literally pull minerals out of your teeth. If you suck a lemon, it chelates the calcium, which means it clumps the calcium in your saliva. I don't know if you've ever put lemon into milk, but you see how it forms kind of clumps in the milk. It does that in a microscopic level in your saliva, and you swallow the clump. So all of a sudden, there is no calcium in your saliva. And so it literally pulls calcium out of your teeth to replace it into, into your, your saliva. So citrus fruits, what, what else is, is detrimental? Uh, citrus fruits, uh, actually spinach. Uh, oh no, I love spinach. I know, but have you ever felt your teeth after you've eaten spinach? The oxalic acid in spinach and in rhubarb, there's a lot of oxalic acid that literally melts the outside of your teeth. Oh, and now you don't get scared because you don't have to give up the things you love. All you have to do is package them. You eat them as part of a meal, and you end the meal with something that is tooth protective. So what would an example of that be? Things that are tooth protective are alkaline foods, uh, and alkaline foods, for example, are usually dairy. Dairy is alkaline. You could end with some chicken broth if you really wanted to. But interestingly, things like chocolate, Good chocolate is it alkalizes, alkalizes your, mouth. your mouth. Does it have to be dark chocolate or milk? Dark chocolate is better because less sugar in it, but okay. it's it's still it, it will alkalize your mouth. So chocolate at the end of every meal is good for your it's, teeth. Is not nearly as bad as you think. It would be much worse to end every meal with a suck of lemon, which actually I had a patient who did that, and she had actually had root canals on all her lower teeth and crowns. She believed she had soft teeth. She was gradually she was twenty two year old wearing out all her teeth with this misconception in one day. Now she has the lemons and then ends the meal. The other most effective thing of all is a sugar called xylitol. Uh, and xylitol is a sugar from birch trees that if you get a one pound bag of xylitol and end every meal with a tiny little bit of xylitol, you could put the end of your teaspoon in this one pound granular bag of xylitol and have like a tiny little bit and if you took pH testing paper, you could measure the change in your mouth and see it is completely alkaline. Wow. Do, do you need to swallow it, or could you simply just mix it in a rinse and you rinse could, it around you your mouth? You could swish it around and, and spit it out, I but I suggest would... you swallow it because it's actually a prebiotic. It helps bacteria, the good kind, grow. It helps your mouth become alkaline and safe and healthy. And it actually helps your digestive system. If you know anyone with Crohn's or uh, GI problems, you know that a lot of people have uh, 
uh, irritable bowel syndrome, those mm -hmm. kind of things. Tiny bit of xylitol at the end of every meal will help you. It's amazing. No, no. Where where could one purchase xylitol? Any health food store here in Austin. You've got Whole Foods. You'd be able to go and get a one pound bag in the baking aisle. It's okay. diabetic. It's a diabetic safe. It's about ten dollars for one pound. As opposed to the fifty cents per pound of regular exactly. granula granulated exactly. sugar. And you just need it at the end of a meal. It's so tooth protective. Another food would be nuts. You could eat salty nuts, which are alkaline. Almonds. Uh, celery, something like celery or fresh vegetables. Um, it's very interesting. So celery is good for teeth, but spinach is bad. Yeah, because of the oxalic acid in spinach. So it's foods become confusing, and that's why I teach people to use xylitol. It's okay. just easier that way. I don't have to start going through. This is this is a good fruit, and that is a bad fruit. Raspberries actually are good. They contain xylitol. Strawberries are good. They will actually whiten your teeth. I became a dentist and became very disillusioned because in England we have national health dentistry which just goes to prove that free dentistry is not necessarily good dentistry. And I think most people know that the British teeth are maybe the worst teeth in the world. And it's a joke because <laughs> Kind of like Austin Powers? Yeah, you know, we've had free dentistry uh, really since World War II and people could go and have any treatment done with no cost whatsoever to them. Uh, what I saw, though, was that people were having their teeth taken out, they were having huge fillings, it was all very unhealthy, and there was a far better way. So, I actually left the country the day I graduated, and I became... The day you graduated? The day I graduated. I got on a plane and I flew to Switzerland, and I worked very hard to become a Swiss dentist in a basically holistic office, an office where we use natural ways to protect teeth. We used foods. Uh, we used some new fangled things, these panoramic x-rays had just been developed, um, but we, we used a lot of food and how, what today would be a sort of holistic approach to dentistry. We did implants back then, this was in the 70s, and uh, we discovered that you really could control dental disease. And that was the sort of basis for me so that within a few years after graduating I went back and opened a private office in a country well, all dentistry was free. You actually had to pay to see me. And people paid because if you came to see me, I would help you not need fillings. You were able to get people to come and see you and pay for your services, even though they could get free dental service. Exactly, because they knew what they were going to get if they went to the free service. And they chose, first of all, they actually, it was the mothers who brought their children to me. And then as they saw their children growing up without any cavities in a country, where most people have cavities by the time they're four years old. Oh my. I mean, children of four or five, I mean, there are children who have no teeth left at the age of 14, 15 in England. Old. Now, when you say moderate fluorosis, you're talking about the damage that is done to teeth through the ingestion of fluoride Correct. and the incorporation of fluoride into the tooth enamel. Well, what actually happens is the fluoride, if it's even mildly strong in a baby's, uh, when the, if a baby ingests even a tiny amount, the first cells, this is what's so ironic, the first cells to be killed by fluoride are enamel-forming cells. They're called ameloblasts. And they are the actual cells that lay down enamel. So I was giving my children fluoride, and they were ingesting it, these little babies of one, two years old. And it was traveling through their body, and when it got to their tooth in the jaw, the little cells that lay down enamel died. So the outer surface of the enamel had formed, but then beneath the surface there was a complete void. No enamel formed because I killed the cells that form enamel. And then you have the dentin on the inside of that. And it is this optical look, it's how your teeth look. White teeth are not, they're actually, it's the reflection that makes them white reflection off crystals. For the dental fluorosis that makes them white? The problem with fluorosis, the, no, the, 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 the brown spots which my first daughter had were actually because there's, there was a complete void and the light goes, it doesn't reflect off the surface at all, it just goes straight through to the yellow underneath the tooth. In the, in the dentin that's underneath the enamel. Fluorosis is not only the replacement of calcium with fluoride in the teeth, but it's, it's the prevention of the development of the enamel. Fluor Fluorosis is actually the, de the prevention of proper development of the enamel, correct. Visit LoneStarPoliticsRadio.com for the full interview with Dr. Ellie Phillips.